Hello, my name is Mark Vernon, and I am with Rupert Sheldrake for another one of our dialogues. Hi there, Rupert. Hello, Mark. These are conversations that we have sparked by things we've been reading or thinking about or experiencing and hoping very much that um, by listening in, it sparks your own thoughts and maybe even other conversations as well. And today, Rupert, we just thought we would talk about the work of the historian Tom Holland, particularly because he has just published an essay, which was a talk given to Theos, the think tank, about humanism and particularly how atheistic secular humanism, the sort that dominates the minds today, I guess, the kind of culture today, is a kind of Christian heresy, Holland argues. And this is a conclusion he's reached following his most recent successful book called Dominion, which is an examination of Christian history. And if I outline the argument very briefly, then Rupert, maybe you can develop it as well. But broadly speaking, as I've understood it, what Holland is suggesting is that the values most closely associated with humanism today, particularly human dignity, human equality, the sense that everybody has rights, the right to vote, the right of freedom, the valuing of the individual, he argues that that is through and through a Christian value, that it's not at all self-evident is the case without the deep ways that Christianity has shaped particularly the West. And so he argues you don't see that automatically as an assumption elsewhere in the world where individual rights can be you know, um, pushed to one side. Um, and also, it wasn't the case in the ancient world. It took Christianity to seed and then um, develop and then finally spread throughout the Western world, um, that sense of the importance of the individual. And so when atheistic humanists write out the Christian element in their inheritance, they're like the heretics who are trying to destroy the place that they've actually come from. So, Rupert, does that make sense to you? Is that kind of yes. what you feel he's saying? Yes, I think. I think personally, I find his argument that this, the whole concept of human rights and equality, um, it's at least equality before the law and equality of voting and so forth. Um, it, it, I find it very convincing that that comes out of the Christian tradition. I mean, Enlightenment rationalists like to think that it's an Enlightenment rationalist um, position. But I mean, where did that come from? Uh, they, they um, Enlightenment rationalism looks back to ancient Greece and Rome, but ancient Greece and Rome were slave-owning societies who certainly didn't believe everyone had an equal right. And uh, the kind of democracy they had in Athens uh, you know, it was only confined to citizens and only some citizens at that. Um, so the the origins of this concept, which is so important in the modern world, uh, I find it very convincing that those come out of taking further uh, tendencies already present in the Christian tradition. And I think that's what underlies a lot of wokeness, for example, the idea that everyone should be included whatever their sexual proclivities, whatever their uh, gender, etc., or choice of gender, um, whatever their race or cultural background or wealth or poverty. Uh, that, that inclusiveness, which is so much part of modern secular human, uh, humanistic human rights um, approach, is very, very all-pervasive. It's more all-pervasive than it was in more Christian societies, um, they, it's it's but it's the same thing in my view taken further, and I think another point he makes is that um, that that in taking over that aspect of uh, the Christian tradition, um, secular humanists have also taken over another aspect, which is a, a kind of evangelical aspect that they have to spread the word and bring those who are darkness in darkness into light. So they have to enlighten people. Um, so that's why you get groups like the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry 
campaigning skeptical groups who see it as their job and and Richard Dawkins of course um, to stamp out superstition to liberate people into the light of science and reason so it's a kind of Christian evangelical uh, a secularized form of Christian evangelical zeal and I think that uh, rather more than just Christian is Protestant um, I think that the roots of this are much more Protestant than Catholic and and wokeness and all these modern manifestations of an evangelical campaigning for human rights are much more common in Protestant Western Europe and in Protestant North America than they are in Southern Europe or Eastern Europe or South America or and certainly more than they are in India or China or Africa. So I think he makes a pretty persuasive case. So I'm a bit more sceptical um, for two reasons, really. One is I wonder about the simplification of the history, um, which is a, you know, a, quite, a, quite a strong thing to say to one of the most celebrated critical historians in the UK. Um, but that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is the way that it's been received by Christians, which deeply worries me as well. And and maybe, you know, what you were saying there about um, it's more of Protestant kind of Christianity than a Catholic kind of Christianity. Maybe that's one way into um, questioning his argument. So, for example, I agree that um, the way that this is now become so prevalent in our culture um, is a much more recent thing say, since the 16th century. Um, I actually wonder whether the seeds for the sense of human equality are um, actually were born really properly in the Renaissance. Um, and for example, the, the famous um, speech by Pico della Mirandola, where the phrase, the dignity of man um, is first really coined and becomes well known. So, you know, Pico was um, an Italian Christian broadly. Um, but if you read The Dignity of Man, his speech, um, you realise that he's drawing in actually all sorts of different traditions, particularly Jewish, Islamic and what he would call pagan, i.e. pre-Christian traditions. And it's a kind of perennialism, really, that he is surfacing there, that he sees in many different traditions a common seed, um, the idea, broadly speaking, that the human is the place where the divine can be known most consciously. It's known throughout nature as well as a kind of theophany, but the human individual is the one that can consciously um, sort of bring their minds, their will, their desire to bear upon the realisation of the divine in the world. Um, he actually, it makes him very against things like astrology, for example, because he thinks the idea that human beings are influenced by the planets and the stars um, if, is, is an offence to the dignity of man, um, that it must spring up from within us um, how we relate to the world, not just be um, kind of part of um, sort of nature. Um, it's a sort of bit of a nature nurture debate, I suppose. Um, and, and then also, um, you know, this idea of the dignity of man, the equality and so on. I mean, Holland links it very much to the idea of the imago dei, the image of God. And certainly in his speech um, and this article, he says that he, he talks about it as if that's written throughout the whole Bible. Um, whereas actually um, the phrase, the image of God, human beings being made in the image of God, occurs in only one place in the Bible which is in the first chapters of Genesis. It is used three times, but within the first 10 or 11 chapters of Genesis. So really only in one place. And, and I feel that it can't have been obvious to most of Christians until, say, the Enlightenment, seeded by the Renaissance, um, that human beings were equal. Um, because, of course, slavery continued for most of Christian history. Um, hierarchies shaped Christian society in the medieval period. So, you know, the upshot for me is that whilst I agree that modern humanism is a kind of modern Christian Protestant, say, um, offshoot, um, I don't think that he can say this is something that, um, you know, is kind of unique to Christianity. 
um, partly because it wasn't obvious, I think, to, to lots of Christians for lots of Christian history, but also because I think in the Renaissance, um, it was a drawing together of different traditions that led to the emergence of this idea of the dignity of man. So I, I don't know what he as a historian would say about that, but, um, you know, it, it at the very least, it seems to me to be fairly clear that human equality wasn't something that Christians took for granted until quite recently, at least. No, I think his argument was that the, it was implicit, though, that the roots of this idea were there in things like canon law in, in, in the Middle Ages, and that there were roots of this idea. Obviously, it wasn't fully formed in, in societies where there were serfs and and overlords and so on. Um, and obviously it wasn't the predominant philosophy in the 17th and 18th centuries when Western European powers, including Protestant ones, ran slave trades like Britain and Holland and, and other countries. Um, so I, I think his argument is that the, the, the roots are, are there and it, it sort of then develops through um, enlightenment, rationalism and, and uh, anti-religious secular humanism. One of his points is that when secular humanists trace their roots, because they also trace their roots, as he shows to, you know, they have uh, what he thinks of cherry picking quotes from different cultures where there are bits about the dignity of man or the humans or the, the human nature being, you know, the equality of humanity. Um, he... Um, he said he said he points out that in, in most secular humanist accounts the one thing they don't include is the christian tradition they're usually against it and they blame the christian tradition for everything that's wrong in the world uh, exploitation of nature the inquisition etc intolerance and so forth um uh, so he thinks that they they actually deliberately try to disavow this aspect of their tradition um and I think one of the things that is interesting in his argument is the tendency for Protestants to be against things um, and think that they're always starting something new. Um, and the uh, the you know they were against the Roman Catholic Church at the Reformation. That's why they were called Protestants, protesting against the, all the abuses of the Roman Church, and they were starting something new. But then once you've started this vociferous process. Um, then Protestant sects just proliferated wildly until you reach this kind of astonishing um, system like in the United States where there's hundreds of churches and anyone can start their own church and you've got this wild proliferation of, of Protestant sects. Um, so that's one of the tendencies and each one of them, when they break off, from whatever they're breaking off from, uh, rejects what went before and thinks they're starting something new. So this Reformation Protestant pattern is repeated in a kind of fractal version over and over again. And secular humanists fit that pattern in the sense that they reject what came before, namely uh, Christianity, um, and in, in to, to form something new. Then, of course, secular humanism has many um, variations itself. I mean, there's the sort of regular humanist association type secular humanism, which is evangelically atheist and campaigns against psychic phenomena, anything they think might hint at more to human nature than the purely material. But then you've got uh, the kind of neoliberal iterations, you know, where humans are autonomous uh, consumers with, and, and then are seen in this kind of more economic um, framework. Um, but all of these seem to me to have a common root and a common pattern. And uh, and one of them is this sense of liberating other people, because neoliberal economics is all about liberating the world from poverty through the power of capitalism and the free movement of capital. Um, they have this liberationist quality, um, which, of course, is very strong, as strongest of all in the United States, which is all based on the idea of individual freedom. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's a lot, of course, in that. A lot of that makes sense. But maybe to switch to my other sort of main concern, which I think connects with what you're saying there, which is that 
it, in a way, it's the, the way this is being received by Christians. So as certainly I've um, witnessed it, um, and, you know, Theos, the think tank, is a kind of broadly Christian think tank, inviting Tom Holland to give their annual lecture. I mean, it feels like a lot of Christians are going, oh, at last, an independent voice is justifying our presence in the modern world. You know, rah, rah, Tom Holland, everyone should read Dominion. And that really worries me because he is justifying the Christian presence in the modern world, you know, through seeding values and and, and also ways of doing things like liberation and, and trying to convert people to the Western way and so on. But it, it's all at a kind of flatland level of morality. And this is one of my kind of bet noirs. So forgive me um, for going off on it a bit. But I really worry about the way that Christianity is reduced to a moral creed. And um, because I think at heart, Christianity is not a moral creed. Um, I think it's actually a revelation of reality. It's about the way things actually are that I think is um, finds echoes in other traditions. And of course, Christianity itself is a kind of amalgam of ancient Greek and ancient Jewish um, perceptions of things that come together. And um, Christians, um, Christianity's success in a way is sort of popularizing um, all that and making it um, a civilizational culture. Um, but if you reduce Christianity to a moral creed, I mean, on the one hand, you amplify that protestant tendency to be at loggerheads with um, others which we see in cultural wars now um, because it reduces everything to a question of is that good is that bad am i on the side of the good therefore they must be on the side of the bad um, which we see quite a lot of um, but but more importantly really is um, if we're going to find a way out of that we need not more moral arguments and you know who's right who's wrong um, but we need to reconnect with the nature of things in themselves and i think that's what christianity is at heart it's a perception of reality nature human life as as many sort of reflections um sharings participations in the divine life and so the incarnation in other words is the christian word that's at the heart of all things and when you sort of have that sense of the transcendent meeting the imminent then you have space um and these arguments don't become kind of red lines in the sand or um you know fight until you die kind of confrontations um because they're seen as a second order um grapplings with the primary matter which is you know ultimately theological or ontological at least and so when holland says this is um, the kind of contingency of history that Christianity has brought these values about. Um, he's actually eroding, I think, um, what matters most about Christianity, which is not that it's a question of historical contingencies, you know, which could have gone differently at one point and will go differently again at another point. But actually, it's about humanity discovering something about its wellspring and source that constellated, particularly in the West, around the figure of Jesus, um, and is known around other traditions and figures in other parts of the world with difference, of course, cultural difference. Um, but, um, you know, I think so when Christians grab onto Tom Holland and say, you know, thank God um, for your ap apologia, um, I say, no, he's actually undoing what really matters most about Christianity. And you're amplifying that undoing by reducing Christianity to a moral creed. But look, that's my that's my kind of oh. I have a big thing about that. Well, I don't. I mean, partly, I mustn't meet different kinds of Christians from you because I haven't met anyone who's even heard of Tom Holland or his, his talk. You know, I go to my local parish church. I go to Coral Evensong in cathedrals and, and things. Um, uh, and, you know, no mention of Tom Holland or of any of these things he's said among the people I talk to um, uh, or read. Um, so I haven't had, uh, I mean, if I had come across that reaction, I might have reacted like you do, but I haven't. Um, and I completely agree with you that Christianity is about much more than morality. I mean, I don't see it primarily as a moral, you know, doctrine. I mean, obviously, it has Christian morality as a major part of it, but I don't see it primarily 
as the source of all morality or upholding morality. And I think when secular humanists say that, you know, secular humanists can be just as moral as Christians, I think they're right, actually. I think many of them may be more moral than Christians in the sense that they put all their emphasis on morality. Um, uh, they don't put any emphasis on transcendence or mystical experience or pilgrimage or the joy of beautiful music in lovely buildings like in Choral Evensong. Or, of course, they put some emphasis on the importance of human art, but only insofar as that shows what great beings humans are. Um, it's all about magnifying humanity, largely, as it turns out, at the expense of the rest of nature. Um, so I think the, the kind of very, very human-centered morality of humanism, which by definition is primarily about the supreme importance of humans, um, is one reason for the ecological crisis, because it, it puts human values vastly above all others. So I, I, I don't uh, myself see uh, Christianity as primarily needing to be justified in terms of its morality or even it's in terms of its historical effects on humanist morality. And like you, I see the main point of it as being an experience of the divine, an experience of God that's uh, experienced by many Christians in, in lots of different ways through prayer, through worship, through thanksgiving, through singing together, through liturgies, through rituals, um, through pilgrimage. Um, and But I suppose above all through mystical experience, because that's the, the sense of direct connection with God is the underlying basis of not just Christianity, but all religions, whether you call God God or not, but a consciousness vastly greater than our own. And that, of course, is the very thing that secular humanism is against, because for them, no God exists, and humans take the place of God as the pinnacle of creation, as the ultimate consciousness in the universe. Um, so um, I agree, if anyone says that the, the principal point of Christianity is providing a moral code, then I would say that's not the principal point, like you. I think that that's a spin-off. It's, it's, it, Jesus was proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of heaven, and that wasn't just a moral code. It was, it was much more of spontaneously responding to the movements of the Spirit. And indeed, in the epistle to the Hebrews and, and in St. Paul, there's a whole lot of going on and on about how awful the law is. Um, I've just been reading Edmund Goss's um, Father and Son, and he describes how when he was six or seven, his very, very um, um, Protestant father tried to get him to understand the epistle to the Hebrews, and and he didn't understand the concept of the law. He just thought the law was a horrible person, and he says how he kept saying, oh, I hate the law, because the law was being so beastly to people. Um, and that was a moral code, uh, a code of behavior. Um, so there's, in many ways, there's a lot about Christianity is not just about codes of behavior or, or doing the right, uh, or being politically correct and all these codes which modern secular humanism are so, uh, is so keen on. Yeah, and, and also to be fair to Tom Holland, um, on occasion I have heard him sort of reflect about his own perspective as a secular historian. And he will say that he understands that's just one perspective amongst others. And it particularly comes to the fore when you're trying to do religious history, because people that don't share the secular perspective will see the history in a completely different way. Um, he's, he's, he's reflected on this in relation to Islam as well as Christianity, because he wrote a book on Islam and, um, you know, got into a lot of sticky water because of it, hot water because of it. Um, uh, but he, he will say that if you sort of strip out the metaphysical aspects, then the history starts to look very different. Um, and so that, though, for me, you know, leads to an, a sort of another question, which is, is very fascinating to ask. But and I think one that's really pressing, which is, you know, what is the model of the human that these various 
people claiming to speak for the human are actually using, be they you know, atheistic humanists or they be they secular scholars. Because again, that feels to me that to be very flat compared to how most humans for most of human history would have understand understood what it means to be human. Um, you know, they wouldn't have understood being human to be um, primarily about logic and reason um, and law and rights um, and kind of struggle and survival in a um, purely material world. Um, they would have understood themselves to have had perceptions and um, experiences, as you're saying, of the mystical, the transcendent. Um, they would have understood this life as being a preparation for a wider life. Um, they would have understood um, that the divine, um, as well as all sorts of other um, non-human entities um, are part of the ecology in which we live and that taking note of, of of all that matters quite as much as taking note of what it is to be purely human um, in the modern sense. Um, and, you know, for me, this points to, in a way, a crisis in the humanities, um, which is a bit, bit like actually what, it reminded me a bit of what Mary Mitchell used to say about um, the life sciences that, and I know you've thought this too, that, um, you know, that the irony of the life sciences, so-called, is they often strip out the bit that's actually to do most with life. Um, and similarly, it seems to me that the humanities strip out much of what it actually has meant to be human in order to tell their histories of, you know, who's up, who's down, um, or claim their rather narrow um, set of values and rights. Um, so he, 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 his, his, his intervention, insofar as people feel or not even notice that he's made this intervention, um, it does raise a much bigger question as well. Well, I agree. I mean, for the vast majority of humanity in the past, and indeed the vast majority of humanity today, being human includes God, gods, angels, spirits, ancestors, um, as living presences in their lives holy places, rituals, um, uh, the importance of thanksgiving, the importance of festivals and ceremonies, uh, the importance of rites of passage for birth, marriage and death at the very least. Um, now, these uh, even secular humanists now have, have ministers who deal with rites of passage. They Even they have to admit these are important. Um, but the the fact is the great majority of humans um, and the great majority of humanity as actually experienced by humans is about and very closely linked to that which is more than human, namely the natural world, the divine, the spiritual realm, and so on. And being human is part of all that. It's not being human with all that stripped away and, and cancelled out and... and um, and so the number of people who actually share in the secular human human nature, even today, is a tiny minority. As Tom Holland points out, humanist congresses, uh, all, nearly all of them have been in, in Western Europe, North America or Australia. And the great majority of people who attend them are white and you know, probably mostly ex-Protestant. Or um, So the... the um, the, this view of humanity is actually a minority view even today. And in this recent census that showed that the more than that Christians are only 49% of the British population or something like that, um, and that a substantial number of people, I've forgotten what, something like, is it 30% or something, describe yeah. themselves as non-religious. Um, that doesn't mean they're all atheists. In fact, they're probably only a minority are atheists. There are very many people now in Britain and increasingly in the US who call themselves spiritual but not religious, um, and whose vision of humanity still includes um, spiritual realms and uh, experiences which are not part of the secular humanist atheist map. Uh, so it's very much a minority view, even in Britain today, which is pretty godless culture, but even here, it's a minority view. And yet, it's been put out as if this is the view of human nature that should dominate all international institutions, uh, United Nations policies, and everything else, uh, and government policies and educational policies. So it is actually a remarkable triumph of evangelical 
a colonization of the media and 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 the educational institutions that a minority position has actually managed to create a culture where this is taken to be by many people the norm and as if it's always been the norm except when corrupted by christianity yeah i suppose that there's you know history of post reformation war in Europe and all that. Um, people argue whether they're really religious wars or not, but the, with the birth of the nation state. And and so that kind of echoes around in people's suspicions of Christianity. But to use another word that, you know, is often banded around today, this sort of this colonization of the past with secular assumptions. I think, I hope it's beginning to swing um, the other way, actually, partly because, as you say, Although people may not identify with any particular religion, that's far from saying they're automatically atheists and quite the opposite. And so it feels to me that there's a kind of pressure or maybe not a pressure, but at least potentially a re re sort of receptivity towards the idea of expanding the human again. And the past then can become a real resource for imagining that um, because we can look at how what people knew before um, you know, not to go back, but to re-engage with that, with the assumptions and the sense of being human that we have now, um, which feels to me it's going to be increasingly crucial, you know, partly because of ecological crises, um, but also just more immediately because of the the sort of dearth of um, the imagination around what it means to be human and um, all the problems that that arises for people, mental health, otherwise, it feels this all kind of connects together somehow, an enrichment, a rewilding of the human. Um, we've talked about the rewilding of Christianity, but perhaps the rewilding of the human needs to happen as well. Well, that's a very good way of putting it, Mark. I, I think it's a very good note on which to end as well. This idea of an expansion of our idea of humanity, drawing on the resources from the past, but going in a new direction because we're in a new situation today. Well, look, thanks very much. I hope teasing that out has been useful for people listening in um, and a good note to end. Yes, thank you. Thank you.